Well, good morning, everybody. My name is Terry. I'm one of the pastors here, and don't be afraid. I'm not going to use this, I promise. If you fall asleep, I promise I won't come by at all. No. Um, I'm one of the pastors here, and it's a joy to be able to welcome you here to Ocean View as we wrap up this series entitled The End of Religion. And if you've been traveling with us in this journey the last couple of weeks, you've kind of learned that Jesus came for a different purpose. Um, Jesus came, in essence, to bring the heartbeat behind religion back to his people. And um, as we approach Easter Sunday in a, in a few weeks, uh, you begin to see and you begin to recognize um, the heartbeat of Christ and the heartbeat of our relationship with God. And uh, I'm excited today because we're going to look at another interaction between Jesus Christ and the religious establishment. And he's going to try to teach a lesson and a purpose that I think applies with all of us in this room today. To kick this off, um, there were several um, months ago that my son and I He's 14 years old. He's a baseball player. And uh, we have a, a special guest here today. And so I thought I would bring all of my baseball illustrations out for you today. But we have a baseball team from Kentucky sitting here with us today. How about a round of applause for them? Now, guys, I, I know this. You, you hate being drawn and hate having attention drawn to you. I understand. But I have a 14-year-old son, and my 14-year-old son, he plays baseball, and he played travel ball, and, and I was noticing him, because I used to coach um, high school and college baseball, I was noticing in his swing that he, he de developed a little bit of a bad habit, and so let me explain to all of you who are maybe not sports-related, don't go to sleep yet, this will be quick, I promise. Okay, so in, in baseball, um, part of the issue is, is that as you accelerate in your growth as a baseball player, pitching becomes faster. When you get to the major leagues, you're looking at anywhere from 90 to 100 miles an hour, and you've got to be ready to be able to hit a baseball at that speed. But when you're at younger ages, that ball is coming at 60, 70 miles an hour, which gives you a lot more time to be able to go through and to be able to swing and to be able to make contact with a baseball. Now, it gives you a lot of time to also have bad habits. And I was noticing in my son's swing that he would get in the box and he would have his hands down low. And all of a sudden, as the pitcher would get ready to throw, he would have his hands here. He would drop his hands back here. He would get back up here. And then he would come all the way through. Now, at his age, he was hitting the ball really well. He was having great success. So I brought him to a, a coach that I know, and I said, hey, I'd love to be able to work on his swing a little bit. And so the coach and I, we said to him, hey, Connor, here's what we're going to do. We're going to shorten your swing. You have a good swing right now. But as you get older, that swing is not going to cut it for faster pitching. So we're going to take your good swing, and we're going to try and make it better. I remember Connor's looking and saying, okay, so we, we all of a sudden, guys, you know this, you get in the box and the coach is telling you where to put your foot, how to hold your hands, and it's really frustrating when you're doing well hitting the ball and you get in the cage and all of a sudden, you know, you're, you're, you're changing your swing and the first pitch come and you, and you swing and you miss. It doesn't feel good. It's like, no, I, I like my old swing better. I mean, it was good. Why are we changing it? So all of a sudden he gets in there and then we tweak his hands a little bit and we tell him to swing again and he fouls it off and then he chops it and he does all this stuff. Well, Halfway through the hitting lesson, I noticed my son getting really discouraged. And so he's in the box, and he's like this. And I said, son, what's the matter? And he looked at me, and he said this, you ruined my swing. <laughs> and being the good dad that I am, I said, you're welcome. No, I didn't say that. That'd be bad. And I said, just trust me. Just stay with it. So for the next 20 minutes, he worked on keeping his hands here and driving through the ball. And all of a sudden, toward the end of the hitting lesson, he started making better contact. And he started getting into games. And he started getting a little bit better. And the pitching started coming faster. And he started hitting the ball a lot better. And I remember talking with him on the way home from that hitting lesson. And I was like, hey, I'm sorry you got frustrated. I said, but hang with it. I know sometimes you love to stay with good. But I promise you, if you trust me, we can make you better. Well, here's the truth. I think in our room here today, watching online in the balcony, there's a lot of us that are feeling pretty good about where we stand in our relationship with God. And I would pose this question. If I were to give you a scale of one to 10 in your relationship with God, 10 being that you are right there with Jesus, and I would say if you rate yourself a 10, then you and I should talk afterwards because then you're perfect, and the truth is we're all not perfect, and you got pride issues. So I know it's a trick question. But between a scale of one to 10, where are you at in your relationship with God? Are you a six? Are you a four? Are you a two? And what I would say is that in all my studies in God's word, one of the greatest things that he always wants us to do each and every day, each and every week, is he wants us to take a step of faith. 
So he doesn't want us to stay at a two. He wants us to be a three or a four or a five or a six. He doesn't want us to stay at a six. He wants us to be a seven. So no matter where we're at in this room today, God wants us to take another state. In other words, he wants us to go from good to great. And one of the reasons why a lot of us don't like to do that is the same reason my son didn't like to change his swing. It doesn't feel comfortable. I've gotten into a habit. and I don't want to do things differently. Well, if that's you here today, and if you're kind of been coasting where you're at, we're going to talk about how you can go from good to great, and more importantly, we're going to talk about how Jesus challenges us to do just that. So I want to show you some pictures, because already some of you, you you can't hold my attention for more than five seconds, so I'm going to show you some visuals, so that way it leans you in a little bit. There's a lot of individuals who are joining me later on this year going to the Holy Land. And by the way, if you're interested in that, um, there is still room and still availability. We'll have a meeting after Easter to talk about it. But I want to show you some pictures of some of the areas that we're going to go to. But more importantly, I want to set up what the story we're going to talk about. So you see a picture right here. And this picture is the Temple Mount. This is what it looked like in the days of Jesus. Now, the Temple Mount still exists in Jerusalem today. It looks far different than what it does in this picture, but it's still there. But the reason why I show you this picture is, is in the middle of this picture is the temple. It's where God's presence rested. And God's people were challenged in the religious system. While here in 2022, we're challenged as followers of Jesus to go to church, to worship with one another, to sing praises to our God, and that's our religious system. Well, back during these times, the Jewish people were challenged to be able to make trips to go to this temple on this temple mount. They would enter, typically, from the southern side. They would walk up the steps, and they would walk to this temple to bring sacrifices and to make sure that they knew that I'm a follower of God. Now, another picture that I want to show you is this, is that we had to prepare back in those days on how we worship God. Take a look at this picture. This is what is known, and this is a picture that we took a while ago, of a mikvah. Now, it looks pretty gross, I know. But back in the day, this is, again, thousands of years old, is on the southern side of that temple... What Jewish people had to do is they would have to walk down one side, and if you look, you could see a little divider. They would walk down one side of the steps. They would go into the water. They would dip themselves in the water to purify themselves, and then they would turn around and they would walk out the other side in preparation to be able to worship their God. It was symbolic. It was as if God said, hey, as you approach the temple, I want to make sure that your heart and your attitude is in the right place. So you would say, God, forgive me. God, cleanse me of all unrighteousness. I come out, and I am cleansed, and I'm looking forward to worship you. Then after you got out of there, and that's there today in Jerusalem, you would then ascend these southern steps. They're going to show up right there. And these southern steps, this is a picture of modern-day Jerusalem today. And if you look closely at those steps, you see they're different sizes. And that was on purpose. And if you've been a part of our church, you know, and I've shared this before, the reason why they were designed to be anywhere Anywhere from 12 inches big to three feet big. The reason why they were made that way is they didn't want anybody approaching God's temple without paying attention. They didn't want it to be a part of the normal facet of life. Those of you that are sitting up in the balcony, you probably don't even remember ascending the staircase to be able to come and sit in the balcony because you've done it all the time. Each step is the right measurement. It's the same measurement. So as soon as you hit that first step, your body just takes over and you go right up. You're not paying attention to what you're doing. Well, the architects did not want any Jewish person approaching the temple of God without paying attention to their steps to know you are approaching God's temple. There's another reason why. When you have to look at your feet as you walk up those steps, because one's 12 inches, one's, oh, one's three feet, one's 12 inches, one's 12, one's three feet. When you have to do that, you have to look down at all times. The architects wanted individuals to have a humble posture as they approached God's temple. Do you see what is happening here? Is that everything in the religious system was set up to make sure that the heartbeat of the Jewish people was in the right place so they could worship God in the right way. And so individuals climbed those southern steps with their face down, humble before their God. The religious system was good. The religious system lasted hundreds and hundreds of years. And the people were used to the religious system. However, when they would approach the temple, and this is where it gets interesting, They were charged with two things. Number one, they had to pay money to be able to pay a tax. And that tax 
you begin to see in Exodus chapter 30, verse 13 to 14. Take a look at this. It says, each one who crosses over to those already counted is to give a half shekel according to the sanctuary shekel, which weighs 20 geras. This half shekel is an offering to the Lord. They need to go ahead and they give it to the Lord. They give it to the temple. So they were required to take a Hebrew shekel to be able to pay this. There's a problem, guys, with this. Back in those days, they used to deal with Roman money. However, Roman money was not accepted at the temple. So the religious people, the Jewish people had to go in, they had to cleanse themselves, they had to walk up the steps. Oh, did you bring my wallet? Do you have any, do you have any Hebrew money? Oh gosh, I, we didn't exchange it. What are we gonna do? I don't wanna go through the mikvah again. I'm already dry. I mean, this is ridiculous. I mean, how are we gonna worship today? Oh gosh, where did you park? Did you park in Goofy Lot? Go back to Goofy Lot, get my wallet, exchange. You understand what's happening here to the Jewish people. And so all of a sudden, they had that problem. There was a second thing that they had to do, and I want you to see this. It says in Leviticus 14, 22, they had to have two doves or two young pigeons, such as they could afford, one for a sin offering and the other for a burnt offering. They had to come and they had to bring a sacrificial animal to sacrifice for their sins. And could you imagine someone looking at them and saying, did you bring the animal? No, where... I thought they were going to have it. There was a booth on the road to Jerusalem, and they didn't have any more. And so what are we going to do? We have to be able to offer it. And so you see two problems that are occurring. So here's what happens. The religious leaders, they decide we're going to get smart about this. We're going to make it easy for the Jewish people to be able to worship God. So here's what they did. At the temple, they went ahead and they created space at the temple They moved people who would be in an attitude of prayer. They said, excuse me, excuse me, we're going to renovate. We have a process here, expansion, we're going to make things better. So they went ahead and they moved the people that were praying in an area out. And then they went ahead and they set up a currency exchange. we got to give our Jewish friends the ability to transport their money. We have to make sure we can exchange a shekel for, or excuse me, a denarii for a shekel. So they created this system. Then they said, let's go ahead and set booths up because You know, it's a long distance to carry a dove and a pigeon. If you lose it, you trip over, and all of a sudden they they release. You don't want that. So if you come to the temple, you could purchase an animal to be able to make your sacrifice. We're going to make the religious system even better. So Jesus Christ comes here, and I want you to see what happens when Jesus enters the temple and he sees what they have done. John chapter 2, verse 13, he says this. When it was almost time for the Jewish Passover, Jesus went up to Jerusalem. In the temple courts, he found people selling cattle, sheep, doves, and others sitting at tables exchanging money. Now, I want you to understand something that Jesus is coming to church, and if he were coming to our church, here's what it would look like. It's as if, as you came into church, there was a sign posted on the door that said, hey, welcome to Ocean View. We're really excited that you're here. We only take $1,000 bills that are printed here at Ocean View. Sorry, we don't take hundreds. We don't take that change, Change, sorry, COVID, no change. And so when you walk into the door, you have to exchange your currency for the Ocean View currency that we have here. And by the way, for convenience sake, you can understand, I mean, it's a lot of work to be able to do this. We're going to charge you a 5% convenience fee to be able to do that. By the way, if you want to go ahead and you give your donation here on the floor in this room, you forgot to do it in the hallway, not a problem. We have boxes, giving boxes on the wall for your convenience. However, we're going to tack on a 5% convenience fee for you to be able to do that today. Could you imagine if Jesus came to Ocean View and walked in and saw us doing that? How do you think he'd feel? Bad. Thank you very much. Participation. I love it. So let's see what Jesus does in this scenario. John chapter 2, verse 15. So Jesus made a whip out of cords, and he drove all from the temple courts, both sheep and cattle. He scattered the coins of the money changers, and he overturned their tables. To those who sold doves, he said, get these out of here. Stop turning my father's house into a marketplace. Jesus came in, and he was furious This is one of a few times that we see Jesus Christ angry. Yes, Jesus got angry, and rightfully so. I can imagine Jesus coming here to Ocean View, and it would be like the same thing if all of a sudden we said, you want first access to the worship center? You want to get prime seating? Well, there's a parking space that's available. However, it's going to cost you $10 to park here. And so for some of us, you could see a parking space. Thank you. You could see a pew speed. Oh, go back. Where'd you go? Whoa, what's going on? Here we go. Go to this one. 
You see a pew seat. I'll read it for you. You see a parking space. Some of you in this room, you'd say, you know what? I'd like to join a small group. I'd like to go to a group. But you know what? Our group, we don't have any windows in our room. We'd really love a group with windows in our room. We say, not a problem. If we can go ahead. We're going to give it to the highest bidder. That's what was happening. And so Jesus looked, and now lean in for a second. Jesus looked, and I have to believe his heart broke. I have to believe he said, you're missing it. You're supposed to be leading individuals and their hearts to understand a gracious and amazing God and to come and to worship and give thanks for all that he's done in their life. That's what you're supposed to be doing. Instead, you're ripping them off. And here's the worst part about it. The religious leaders, the Jewish people, many of them, they got comfortable with the system. They sat there and they said, you know what? This is okay because, Jesus, it's good. In fact, in John 2, 18 through 20, I want you to see what happens. Take a look. All of a sudden, Jesus looked at him and said, I'm going to tear all this system down. And all the people around said, it's taken 46 years to build the temple. And you say that you're going to tear it down and you're going to raise it up in three days. Jesus, get out of here. Don't change things. We like good. We like where it is. And Jesus challenges them and says, there's something better coming. Here's my point. I think a lot of us in this room right now, whether you're two, you're three, you've gotten comfortable with your religious system. There are some of you that have a time in which you wake up in the morning and you pray and you learn and you grow about God. Guys, I know what it's like to be a baseball player and to have to be a follower of Jesus. It's not easy. I know what it's like to be able to sit there and have homework, and I know what it's like to sit there and to have just no time because I'm always on the field, and so I neglect the most important aspects of my life, which is my faith. And so there were times when I would make excuses and I would say, you know what, I just don't have time. I'm too tired. There's just not enough time to be able to have a day-to-day relationship with God. There's not enough time to go to church. There's not enough time to be able to do the right thing. You know what, if I do the right thing, then other people are going to make fun of me. They're going to laugh at me because, you know what, it's not cool to go out there and say, let's go out and kick their butt. And so I don't necessarily want to be an example. I don't want to be a strong Christian because, you know what, life is hard. And if that's you in this room, whether you're in the workplace, I don't want to speak up to someone. I don't want to let people know I'm a Christian. I don't want to stand up when someone laughs or makes fun of someone. If that's you in this room, then you're settling for good. One of the things I love going back to baseball a little bit is the good way, and lean in here a second. If you're a baseball player and you're playing in the field, you're taught as an infielder to make sure that you're prepared. If a pitch is being thrown, you want to be prepared for the baseball. In life, we say we should be prepared at everything that's coming at us in life, right? Right? So in baseball, the way we tell baseball players to do this when they're really young is, is you want to do a left, right, left. And I've taught this before in our church, that when all of a sudden a ball is possibly going to be hit at you, you want to make sure as the pitch is getting ready to be thrown, you want to make sure you want to do a left, right, left, right? And we learn that, and it's good, and it gets our feet moving because if a ball's hit, we can react to the left or to the right. However, that's a good way to do it, but it's not great. And sorry, coaches, if I jump your coaching for a second. But one of the things that you learn as you get into higher levels of baseball is what is better than that is to learn to time what we call a hop. And I've taught this to our church before, the Christian hop. And what a hop is is that you learn that as the ball crosses the plate and as a batter goes to swing and hit a ball, you want to be at the top of your hop. Because if you're at the top of your hop and the ball is hit, when you read it going to the left or you read it going to the right, as you're coming down and hitting the ground, you can go in motion like this. That was quick right there, wasn't it? You saw that. Quick. Impressive, right? Impressive. I know, I know. I know my stuff. All right, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Here's the point. There are many of us in the balcony on the floor and watching online that are still living life going left, right, left. Life has gotten tougher. You've become an adult. There's more responsibility. There's more hardships, and you're still living life as a 12-year-old going left, right, left. And God is calling you to move to go from good to great. And the way that he calls you to do it is you need to learn to respond to situations in life better. You need to learn the Christian hop. And if you learn the Christian hop, it means you deepen your relationship with God. It means you're no longer going to settle for a two or a three or a four. But instead, you're going to get back to the heartbeat of your relationship with God. And you're going to say, God, I don't want to live a religious system anymore. I don't want to just go to church. I want to be the church. 
I don't want to just act like a Christian and my heart is in the wrong place. I want to be a follower of Jesus. And so for many of us in this room, it's time for us to stop being good. Yes, a pastor just said that. It's time for us to move to great. There's a guy by the name of Mark, and I want you to see this, guys, because Mark writes it differently. He writes about the same story. And take a look at what Mark says about this interaction. He says this in Mark 11:15. 15. On reaching Jerusalem, Jesus entered the temple courts and began driving out those who were buying and selling there. He overturned the tables of the money changers and the benches of those selling the doves. And he would not allow anyone, don't miss this, to carry merchandise through the temple courts. And I think we begin understanding why. This is a place of prayer. This is a place where your hearts are to be in the right place. This is not a place to transact transact business. And so what was so important about that moment? If you didn't hear anything I say, I want you to hear the next three statements and then you go back to sleep. Nothing is more important than someone's relationship with God. Nothing is more important than someone's relationship with God in your family. Nothing is more important than someone's relationship with God with your friends. Nothing's more important than someone's relationship with God with with your coworkers. And guys, nothing is more important than someone's relationship with God with your teammates. Because I learned a long time ago, my baseball days playing are over. And I wish I could go back and I wish I could have known that principle so that I could have been a better follower of Jesus. Because here's the truth. Isn't it true that the only way to know God is to know someone who knows God? The only way to know God is to know someone who knows God. And so if every one of us is settling for good and all of us are saying in this room, it's okay to be good as a Christian. I'm going to be a two. I'm going to be a three. And that's okay. I don't have to do anything else. Then how are individuals going to see the mighty power of God's hand? Unless followers of Jesus go from good to great. In that same passage, I want you to read what happens after Jesus turns the tables over. Here's what he said. It said, and as he taught, he said, is it not written, my house will be called a house of prayer for all nations, but you've made it into a den of robbers. I keyed in on this. It is a temple for all nations. So does that mean all the nations are going to come to that temple? Is that what Jesus was meaning? No, remember, Jesus actually said, I'm going to destroy this temple and I'll raise it again in three days. And so here's where I close, and this is very interesting. You ready? Because here's what I think is going to happen. Some of us are going to leave this room, and some of us are going to sit there and say, you know, Pastor Terry said, but I'm I'm a pretty good Christian. I don't need to change much. You know what? Pastor Terry's great, but what else can I do? I mean, we go to church. I mean, it it was great. The the final four, you know, we got the two tomorrow. And by the way, Kansas was my winner in the bracket, so woohoo. Anyway. You know what? Life is going to go on. This is going to be great. You know, the disciples did that. Do you know as they exited Jerusalem, this is amazing, guys. Jesus' followers are all following Jesus, and they're like, man, he was mad. Did you see what he did? Oh, my gosh, they're going to kill us. I mean, he's talking about destroying God's temple. What is, are we following a madman? Is he crazy? I mean, did we do the right thing? I mean, we thought we had it made. We were rock stars, and now he's just blown it. What is Jesus doing? We had it good. Watch what they say to Jesus. Watch this. In Matthew 24, 1 through 10, Jesus left the temple and was walking away when his disciples came up to him to call his attention to the buildings. Do you see what they said? The disciples said, hey, Jesus, isn't our religious system great? Isn't it good? I mean, I know you just made some havoc, but I mean, it's not that bad, right, Jesus? I mean, you're not, you're not, crazy, right? I mean, we're we're following the right person, right? I mean, you're doing things that are making us uncomfortable, Jesus. I mean, can't we just go back to the way it was? Can't we just go ahead and just let him be? I mean, this is how we're supposed to worship God. So what are you doing? And watch what Jesus says to them. He says, do you see all these things? Don't miss that. Do you see that temple that I'm going to call a thing? 
That thing that you worship and you're idolizing, it's a thing. Truly I tell you, not one stone here will be left on another and everyone will be thrown down. I believe God is challenging all of us in this room today, watching online in the balcony. We're holding on to our religious things. We're holding on to good. And today God's calling us to throw our things down and to be radical and to say, God, I'm not gonna settle for good. I wanna be great. And God wants to take our good and make it great. And what the enemy wants in all of us is he wants us to sit still. He wants us to stay with good. He wants us not to change for years. But God wants to bring purpose to the paralyzed. God wants to bring life to those of us that feel pain, darkness, and despair, and nobody knows it. God's working in all of our lives. So are you brave enough? Are you brave enough to tell your family, I'm gonna take a step? Are you brave enough to tell your teammates, I'm gonna take a step? Are you brave enough to stand up when you see a coworker say something they shouldn't say? And are you brave enough to say, brother, I love you, but that's not right? And if you do those things, you begin to learn what it means to go from good to great. And when you do that, you inspire a generation, a generation like these guys here, to know what it truly means to be a great believer in Jesus Christ. Let's all be great and stop settling for good. Would you pray with me? Heavenly Father, thank you so much for this message. Thank you, Father, for your heart. God, my heart just cries out, God, for all of us. Lord, I'm guilty. I fall in love with our religious systems. I fall in love with three songs and a message. I fall in love with driving and parking and going to church and rinse and repeat. But God, you are challenging us to not forget the heart behind why we do what we do. So God, I ask that you would, in this room, as you see every heart, wherever they're at, if they're in a two, if they're a three, maybe there are some here today that have never trusted you as Lord and Savior. And God, if that's an individual in this room right now, and that's what you're calling them to move and to be able to be in a place of trust of you, I pray today that they would trust you for the very first time. They don't have to know everything. They don't have to have the religious system figured out. All they have to do is take a step of faith. And God, when they do, they will grow leaps and bounds because you will open their eyes and allow them to see the heart behind your purpose. So God, today we tell you that we love you. And we ask that you would bless the words that have been given. For it's in your precious and holy name we pray. Amen. May God bless you.